of the murder of Adrian Reynolds. Since we covered the murder itself in part one, I wanted to go ahead and start talking about the charges in the trial of the three teens who participated in her death. If you haven't yet, go listen to part one so that way you can understand the events that actually happened. And again, I did want to go ahead and give you the trigger warning like in the last video. We are talking about the murder of a teenager and it does include burning and dismemberment, which is just awful, but trigger warning. Holy trigger warning. So I want to start off talking about Nathan for a second. Nathan was the one who was 16 at the time, and he helped dismember Adrian's body. 
Um, if we remember from part one, he was charged with the concealment of a homicide for his role in the aftermath of her murder. So he admitted to using his grandfather's handsaw to dismember Adrian so that she couldn't be identified. It was actually his grandmother that turned him in because she remembered seeing her grandson with Sarah the day that Adrian went missing and decided to snoop around. Thank you, Grandma. She ended up finding the saw hidden in a backpack matching the same one that she saw her grandson carrying that day. Thankfully, she turned it into police and Nathan was arrested. He pled guilty to his charge and received five years in a juvenile detention center. He was released from custody in 2008 at age 20 after only receiving four years for his role in Adrian's murder. Now, in 2012, Nathan was involved in a car accident with two other people where the vehicle he was riding in crashed into a tree and burst into flames. Unfortunately, all men suffered extensive burns and were pronounced dead at the scene. Due to the nature of their remains, it took police and coroners some time to help identify the bodies. When Adrian's father was interviewed and asked about how he felt knowing what happened to Nathan, he stated he didn't feel one way or the other about what happened, but he does feel for the family who lost a child just like he did. Now, I did just want to say that this was the only part that Nathan was involved in. He wasn't involved in the murder of Adrian. He wasn't in the vehicle. He wasn't around the vehicle. He was only there during the dismemberment. And since he was a juvenile when he was arrested, a lot of the court documents just aren't available. So I wanted to just go ahead and give you that bit of information and so that way you know why we don't really talk about him too much after. Now before we skip forward to their trial, I really feel like we need to go back in time and look at some of the reasons that this murder could have happened and why. So let's do a little history lesson. So, Adrienne Reynolds' mother was only 16 when she got pregnant, and neither her or the father were ready. Thankfully for unborn Adrienne, her grandmother and her new husband were willing to adopt Adrienne and take over her care. When Adrienne was three, though, her adoptive parents divorced and her grandmother was given custody. Her adoptive father, Tony, does everything he can to stay in her life and help raise her. By the time she was six years old, her adoptive mother and her adoptive sister, who we now know is actually her mom, moved away from where Tony lives, but he still made an effort to try and see Adrian as much as possible. That is, until he's arrested and sent to prison to serve time on a drug charge. Her sister, who is really her mother, was working on getting her life back together. She had recently remarried and had another child, and she wanted Adrian back. Things really began to take a turn for Adrienne once she started living with her mother, and by the time she was 15, Adrienne and her mother could no longer be around each other. I'm going to go ahead and assume that's because of how close in age they are. Um, probably felt like sisters. But because they were having trouble getting along, this really put Adrienne on a terrible path that would ruin the rest of her life. So she decided to move in with her adoptive father, Tony, who was now out of prison, and his new wife, Joanne. Now, I'm sure you can do a Google search or listen to other podcasts about this case to find out what the path was that Adrienne was on during this time of her life, but I don't feel like shaming her any more than she's already been. What I do know is that she was headed down a really bad path, and by making the decision to move with her adoptive father and her new stepmother, this actually gave her a chance at a new life. This new life consisted of getting a part-time job at Checkers and enrolling at the Black Hawk Outreach Center, which is basically a last resort for teens and adults to obtain their GED. Um, Adrian wanted to get her GED because she had hopes of becoming a Marine. Now, Sarah and Corey had already been attending the Outreach Center when Adrian arrived. Sarah had actually convinced Corey to leave his current high school and enroll at the Outreach Center so that way they could hang out more. Some peers would describe Sarah as the leader and Corey as Sarah's puppy dog, as he was known to do anything that Sarah asked because he never wanted to lose her. Sarah was the one who introduced Corey to the juggalo lifestyle, which for those of you who don't know what a juggalo is, like I didn't, apparently it's the name of a fan of the group Insane Clown Posse, or ICP, and it should not be confused with a gigolo, which is what I initially thought it was. Seriously, picture the reaction that I had just seeing that they were dressed like clowns, thinking that they were gigolos. <laughs> I hate myself. I hate clowns, though, too, so 
That was a holy plot twist. Adrian didn't have any problems fitting in when she arrived at the outreach center. The students would describe her as beautiful, interesting, and catching the eye of almost every boy there, including Sarah. Sarah made comments to friends about wanting to get to know Adrian more, and soon the pair were writing each other love notes back and forth. While Adrian's social status continued to climb, Sarah started to get jealous, and even though the pair were talking about being together, Sarah starts claiming that Adrian was being fake and she wasn't one of them. So she came up with a plan to test Adrian and see where her loyalties were. Could she be the perfect girlfriend, or was she just faking the kind of person that she is? Sarah was determined to find out. Sarah decides to invite Adrian to a house party that was meant for the Juggalo crew. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. I just cringed so hard at myself. But this house would serve as the perfect place for Sarah to conduct, conduct her test of loyalty. Sarah and Adrian arrive at the party, and Sarah makes sure to spread the word that Adrian was there to get laid. Not only that, but she basically gave her consent to Adrian to hook up with whoever she wanted. I'm not sure what she was thinking, but that plan backfired, because now Adrian was getting more attention than ever and was giving less to Sarah, which again caused her to be even more jealous and view Adrian as a threat. At some point during the party, Adrian tells Sarah that she has a headache and Sarah sends her into the room down in the basement to lie down while instructing another male party goer to take care of her. The fact that he obeyed and went down there with Adrian just infuriated Sarah more. Later that night, Sarah drove Adrian home without as much as a peep about being mad at her for hooking up with somebody else. But Adrian would soon learn exactly how mad Sarah actually was. After the party was over, Adrian instantly notices that there's a difference in her social status, and she can't understand what could have happened at this party to change everybody's mind so quickly. But she was able to locate the source. You guessed it, Sarah. Sarah was using her powerful status as a juggalo, along with her social status at the outreach center, to rip away Adrian's and create her a new one. Whore. Slut. Shortly after the party, Adrian goes back to the house hoping to make amends with Sarah, but once Sarah finds out that she was there, she also quickly arrives and has one mission, to call out Adrian and embarrass her in front of everybody. Not only that, but while she was there, she was going off on her and she actually pulled a knife out on Adrian. Now, this is where most people would have backed away and detached themselves from that person because now her safety's been compromised. But Adrian was not going to let this cast her out. She was a fighter, and she was determined to win Sarah and her popularity back. Unfortunately, nothing Adrian did would change Sarah's mind, and Adrian's parents began to notice that the fall of this friendship was taking a toll on her. They decided that she should start seeing a counselor and put her on some medication to help stabilize her depression. Soon after, things started shifting in the right direction for Adrian again. She was getting back to her old self, slowly began to touch her detaching herself from trying to get Sarah's friendship back. It was at this point that Adrian and Corey actually started hanging out together without Sarah. They had become close enough that Adrian felt she could talk to Corey and tell him that Sarah doesn't treat him very well. Unfortunately for Adrian, Corey slips up and Sarah learns of Corey and Adrian's secret relationship and decides that that's the last straw. It's at this point that Sarah comes up with an unthinkable plan to get rid of Adrian for good. After they were arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder and one count of concealment, Sarah pled not guilty and Corey pled guilty and agreed to testify against Sarah. In 2005, Sarah sat before a judge and was tried on her charges. Corey testified against Sarah during her trial, admitting that it was Sarah who strangled Adrian and that he was only there holding her down for Sarah. Nathan also testified during this trial, telling the court that Corey and Sarah had told him about the murder and then was asked to bring a saw and finish the job. Both stories now point to Sarah as the leader and that they were just following her requests. Nathan also testified that it was Corey and Sarah who asked if he could help dispose of Adrian's body. He tells the court that Sarah admitted to hitting Adrian in the face and then hit her over the head with a stick. It was then that Corey held Adrian down and Sarah strangled her. 
He states that Corey and Sarah told him that there was blood coming out of her mouth. Corey and Sarah had picked him up on Sunday where he brought the saw and they decided to dismember Adrian's body. The prosecution used several witnesses from the outreach center to give accounts of things that Sarah was saying before the murder. She apparently made claims that she wanted to kill Adrian, but nobody took her seriously. Sarah also dated in her entry just hours before the murder that she also wanted to kill Adrian. On Friday, January 21st, 2005, the day that Adrian went missing, Sarah wrote, Stupid bitch needs to back up off my Kool-Aid. She's going to give him a note while I'll fucking kill her. A classmate of the three states that on the day Adrian disappeared, Sarah was talking about pretending to be friends with her so she could take her somewhere, beat her up, and send her to an early grave. She also says that Sarah's plan included leaving her body somewhere in an isolated location. Another witness who was a co-worker of Sarah's from the cinema that she worked at said that Sarah told her she had strangled and choked a girl in her car that day and that was the same day that Adrian went missing. This same witness was there at work with Sarah when she received the call from police asking her questions about Adrian's whereabouts. The prosecution was also able to find several witnesses who were in the parking lot at the time of the murder and had noticed something was going on in the vehicle, but at the time they chalked it up to just teenagers fighting. One of the witnesses says they looked at Sarah dead in the face while she was sitting in the front passenger seat, even though Sarah claims that she never left the driver's seat. Another witness claims that he noticed the car in the parking lot and it looked like someone was getting beat up. Now, Sarah decided to take the stand in her own defense. She continued to say that she was there when Adrian died, but it wasn't her who strangled her. It was Corey. Corey had became aggressive when he noticed that Sarah was hurt in the altercation and decided to attack Adrian by strangling her with a belt. Sarah admits the only reason that she helped cover up the murder was because she was scared that he would kill her too. She also tells them that she never had an opportunity to get away from Corey to tell somebody what happened, even though after the murder she was at work when police called her to ask her some questions about Adrian's disappearance, and she wasn't even arrested for at least four days after she was reported missing. Once the case was handed over to the jury, they ended up being unable to reach a verdict. Eleven of the jurors thought that Sarah was guilty, while one did not, which resulted in a mistrial. Sarah went back to trial in February of 2006, and thankfully this time with a jury voting unanimously to convict her on all charges. She was sentenced to 48 years for murder and five for the concealment. Corey also went to trial in 2006, where he ended up pleading guilty to all three counts and was sentenced to 45 years for murder and five for concealment. Sarah petitioned for a new sentence stating that we have laws now that would have protected her rights back then when she was found guilty, and because of this, her sentence should be looked at. Thankfully, in 2020, a judge turned down her request for a new hearing. Corey was, however, granted a new sentencing hearing, which infuriated Adrian's parents. They made sure to show up and give impact statements before the judge made his ruling to remind him that Adrian was never given a second chance because her life was cut short. Corey expressed his apologies for what he did and asked the court to recognize that he was a child when he made these mistakes. He expressed his apologies to Adrian's family and stated that he's doing everything that he can so that way he can look Adrian in the eyes in a next life. Ultimately, the judge sentenced Corey to his original 45 years. When Adrian's father was asked to comment on Corey's statement, Tony said, I'm pretty sure you're going to hell, so you're not going to see her. While serving time in prison, Sarah's appearance changed, and she's now sporting a more masculine look. Corey's appearance has also changed. Now he's known as Harley Quinn and is going by she, her pronouns. As of today, both Corey and Sarah are still serving their prison sentence for the murder of Adrian Reynolds. I want to give a big shout out to the Quad City Times, um, qctimes.com. $3 for a three-month trial to go ahead and look at all of the articles about Adrian Reynolds and what happened during that court case um, in chronological order. So... Big shout out to them. Um, This could not have been done without them. 
Now, because we do talk a lot about Corey and Sarah, I wanted to include the victim impact statement that was done by Joanne Reynolds, which was Adrian's stepmother who was married to her adoptive father, Tony. So I did try to actually record this myself, um, but unfortunately, while I was reading the victim impact statement, I started choking up. So we are going to get a cute little AI-generated um, talk-to-speech for this. I wasn't able to find the audio for the entire victim impact statement. I was able to find clips, but I feel like the entire statement that she did say um, was pretty, it hit pretty hard. So, and this was the impact statement that was done when Sarah was retried again after her first mistrial. Your Honor, this is the hardest letter I have ever had to write. Starting from the beginning when we realized Adrienne was missing, Tony and I were frantic. We started making phone calls to everyone we could think of. When I finally got a hold of Sarah, she was cool as ice. Sarah told the story how she left Adrienne at McDonald's after an argument. Sarah was very sincere. After five days of hell we learned Adrienne was dead. That's the worst news a parent can receive. We had to hear from the media that Adrienne's body had been dismembered. I cannot begin to tell you the visions I have in my head. I have had to get counseling and go to the doctors for sleeping pills, which I still take today. I still have problems going out in public to have fun because I feel it's not right to have fun after Adrienne's been murdered. Your Honor, let me tell you about Adrienne. Adrienne was a normal 16-year-old girl who liked boys. Adrienne came here from Texas to start her life over. Like most families we had problems, but together we were going through counseling. Adrienne got through to my heart, and I never got the chance to tell her I loved her. I miss her, your honor. Adrienne had dreams. She wanted to be an American Idol. She loved to sing. Adrienne wanted to be a designer that did detail paintings on cars. We were planning a graduation party for Adrienne. She was working very hard to get her GED. Adrienne had dreams of being a Marine. Your Honor, since January 21, 2005, I have not been able to stop thinking what horror Adrienne had to go through. I think about Adrienne crying in the car. I think about Adrienne being strangled. I think about Adrienne's burned up body. I think about her head and arms being in that manhole. You Honor, what kind of a person can do this? Your Honor, Sarah asked for a fair trial and she got it. What about Adrienne? Sarah didn't give Adrienne a fair trial. She tried and convicted and gave Adrienne the death penalty. Adrienne just wanted to be Sarah's friend. Because Sarah cannot receive the death penalty because she has laws to protect her, I ask you give her the max. Because she is evil enough to have someone cut up Adrienne's body, I ask you give her the max. Because Sarah showed no remorse, I ask you give her the max. Because Adrienne is not ever coming home, I ask you give her the max. Adrienne just wasn't anybody. She was Adrienne Lee Reynolds, and I want her to come home. Your Honor this could have been anybody's daughter, please give her the max. Your Honor, please do not take into consideration that Corey Gregory only got 40 years. Sarah Kolb was the leader of the pack. Sarah Kolb is the one who ordered Adrienne's death. Your Honor, Sarah Kolb is a cold-blooded killer. She shows no emotion. She is not sorry that she killed Adrienne. She's sorry she got caught. In her phone calls to the police she was cool as ice. Sarah Kolb was in control of the whole situation. Your Honor, 60 years is nothing compared to what Adrienne Reynolds got. I just want her to come home. Thank mm -hmm. you.